Well, a very, very good morning, family. So good that we can come together, that we can praise God, just be in His presence and really enjoy life as children of God. We in this really, really incredible series. It's incredible to me because so many times when I, when I speak to people, you know, we've got these different levels of con conversation and, and sometimes I'm on just level one and I go to people and I say, how are you? So often people are going to say, I am surviving. And, and we need to move from surviving to thriving. We're in this series, and Pastor Kevin was talking about how it's important to get pride under control, that we can humble ourselves before God and just accept His grace into our lives so that we can move on the journey. And then he was also talking about how important it is for us to have purity in our lives, to just understand what God's will for us is as He gives us directions on how to live to understand that there's reason behind what He tells us to do, what He asks us to do. And if we will live in accordance with His purity, that we will experience the blessed life. And then He was also last week, Pastor Kevin was talking about how important it is for us to live in accordance with the purpose that God has for us. For us to find out what is the specific purpose that God has for me in the situation that I am, for you in the situation that you're in. And for you to then live that out. So if you've missed any of these, I, they're available online. I strongly encourage that you just listen to that and you will be encouraged by it. And as we think about this idea of moving from where we feel like we're just barely surviving and we feel like we need to thrive, one of the things that's important is for us to take our place at the table. And so I'd like to talk about uh, God's call for us to come to the table. This is what God wants, that we be there. The striving, the, the surviving, sometimes as we face these struggles, I think it's important to recognize that Satan is a part of this world system and that he is responsible for an incredible amount of calamity that we have to live through and struggle through. Sometimes... We go to the place where we don't understand it. We, we're asking, why does God even allow Satan to be here in this place? And as we think about that, there are a couple of things that I want us to just remind ourselves about. Number one is that Satan is a created being. He was not created evil. He was given free will. He was given the ability to choose, and he did make the wrong choices, and we struggle with the choices that he made and the influence that he is able to exert over us. But the second thing I want us to remember is God is faithful. He will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we are able to endure. But with each temptation, He will provide a way out so that we can stand up under it. So God will watch over us and He will protect us and He will allow us to grow from the struggles that we face. Sometimes I look at the situations and as I look at the trials, perhaps as ankle weights. Initially, I was grappling with the concept of ankle weights. I'm wondering why is it that if somebody wants to be an athlete, you want to perform at your peak, you really want to be faster, you want to be stronger, and you put these weights around your ankle and all of a sudden, you're not as fast as we expect you to be. You're running slower because you've been weighed down. You're not as strong as what we're expecting to be. And I'm like, why would people go to do this to themselves? And the answer is because that's just for training. When they go into the competition, when they're in the game, they're not going to come into the game with ankle weights. They're just using that so that they can be stronger and so that they'd be able to endure more, that they would be tougher than the competition. And as I think about that as well, I think about Joseph as he goes through life. I'm thinking his ankle weight must have felt like a ball and chain. I mean, here's a person who is born into a family that is a polygamous family and there are some struggles that are going on. There's rivalry taking place among the wives. I remember one incident where Leah uh, is approached by Rachel, and Rachel says she's noticed that Reuben had been picking some mandrakes. And so she says, uh, oh, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. And the response, I think, was livid. 
It's like, isn't it enough that you have taken my husband? Now you want, his, you want my son's mandrakes as well. And, and we know that that isn't really the truth of what happened. We understand. If, I think we need to read the story if, we, if you don't know what I'm talking about. But um, sometimes the rivalry in families can really create a tense, difficult situation to grow up in. For Joseph, as he grows up in this family, one of the, I think probably one of the biggest struggles for him would be when his brother was born. When Benjamin was born, the trauma of the birth was such that Rachel died shortly after the childbirth. And so he's, he's growing up in this environment that's difficult. And Joseph is the one who's responsible, I think, to take care of provide for just the, the, the comfort and, and, and that family environment for his younger brother, Benjamin. And he does. He does it really well. He, there's a bond. You can see it later on in life that the bond between them is really strong, and you admire that. But we also notice that their father, Jacob, really loved Joseph. He was born to his favorite wife after years and years of just praying and hoping for a child, and then he came through. But the love, the favor of this one son over the other children in the family was actually a problem. See, when, when Jacob decided that he was going to make a multicolored coat for his son, a, a coat that he was just this one son was going to get, and the others were to look up to that and envy it, he was creating a problem in the family. And his brothers disliked him because of that. But it didn't end there. There was a time when Joseph had a dream and he dreamt that he and his brothers were in a field that they were cutting uh, some sheaves with a sickle and they were putting them into bunches. He says to his brothers, hey, here's the dream that I had. We, we had these sheaves and your sheaves all bowed down to my sheaf. I'm not sure what kind of reaction he thought he was going to get from that. If he was thinking that they were going to say, oh, mighty one, wonderful brother, we'll, we'll right now just bow down to you, it didn't happen. In fact, it made them dislike him even more. Well, he feels the tension and he feels the aggression. And he goes ahead and he shares the other dream. He comes to them and he says, oh, another dream that I had. I dreamt that the sun and the moon and 11 stars bowed down to me. And it didn't go down well. They hated him all the more. There was a time when their father actually asked Joseph, go and find your brothers. They're looking after sheep. Take some food for them and check to see that everything is okay. And he went out there. He looked for them. He went to Shechem. That's where he thought uh, that they would be. Turns out that they weren't. He asked somebody where, if, if they'd been seen. He goes to Dotham. It's a distance. When he gets there, the reception that he gets is extremely hostile. They see him coming and they say to each other, oh, here comes the dreamer. Why don't we kill him and then we'll see what comes of his dreams. I mean, family relationships have deteriorated to a point where 10 brothers want to actually murder one of their brothers, their own flesh and blood. And they feel like it's okay, it's the right thing to do. Something has gone horribly wrong in this family. Well, Reuben is the eldest, and as they try to kill him, Reuben steps in and he stops that. He says, let's not kill him, let's put him in a pit. Joseph ends up in this pit. There's a group of Ishmaelites who are coming through, and so they take him out. Reuben isn't there when they take him out. Judah says, we're not going to gain anything if we kill him. Let's sell him. And so they do. For 20 pieces of silver, he's on his way. And it's not a pleasant journey. If you have a look at the distance from Dothan on a map to Cairo, it's a long way and the terrain is difficult. It's wilderness territory. You can see him not as, they don't see him as a human being. They see him as a commodity to be traded. They want to make sure that he doesn't escape because they paid 20 pieces of silver. So he's probably bound at night, maybe during the day as well. He's walking behind camels. It's dusty. It's hot. It's, he's thirsty. It's a miserable trip. 
And when he gets to the end of it, he's sold. He becomes a slave. For me, the sad thing is that he's only 17 years old when all of this is happening to him. And in this place, in this life as a slave, he is from a Hebrew culture and he is in Egypt. And in those days, there was some animosity between the Hebrews and the Egyptians. We're not really sure. I'm not really sure what the reason for it is. But there's two things that the text tells us. One is that Egyptians did not like the shepherds. If you were a shepherd, and, and Joseph is from a shepherding family, shepherding background, for whatever reason, the Egyptians looked down on shepherds. But then another thing is that in those days, Egyptians would not sit at the same table as a Hebrew person. Again, I don't understand why. When I look to their common roots, I can go back to Adam and say, man, these are all descendants of Adam. We are really one people. God is our father and we're descendants of God. But even if I go back as far as Noah, Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and those are the people who populated the earth. That's where the Egyptians come from. That's where the Hebrews come from. I mean, there used to be a family. They used to work together. They used to have building projects together. They used to look after animals together. They used to go on boat trips together. It was a wonderful time, a great family life. And then all of a sudden, in a period of about 14 generations or 500 years, something has happened to where you've got this one group saying, we will not sit at the same table as that group. There's history in there. And we don't really know what is it that, that would drive people to that point to make those decisions. But we're seeing this young boy, 17 years old, coming into a situation where he is a slave and the other slaves around him are Egyptians. I see him sitting and eating his meals alone. I see him trying to learn a language that he doesn't understand in a culture that in those days did not like him. And I feel for him, I feel like he's really struggling. It's almost like he's got nobody. He doesn't know where to turn to. He doesn't know who's going to help him. And he's struggling. I firmly believe that in that difficult situation, he turned to God. That he decided that he was going to draw near to God. And we know the principle that if you draw near to God, God will draw near to you. And I say that I firmly believe that's what he did for a couple of reasons. Number one, when he was working in Potiphar's household, everything that he touched was successful. It had the blessing of God on it to the point where Potiphar actually said to Joseph, you are in complete control over this entire household. He didn't worry himself with anything. Everything was under Joseph's control, and he was enjoying a good, prosperous life. When you go to Potiphar, when Joseph is in charge, and you ask him, how are you doing? He's not going to say, oh, I'm just surviving. He's going to say, no, I am thriving. I have the favor of God on my life. And the other reason that I believe that the favor of God was on Joseph's life is in the decisions that he makes. He's able to make, he does make godly decisions even under trying circumstances. So, yes, he's experienced the hostility in the family. Domestic violence would have been a part of his growing experiences now he comes to a place where he has to deal with accusation of sexual offenses against him. In a situation where he was tempted on a daily basis to live an immoral life, he was going back to saying, I know what God expects of me and what God is asking me to do in the situation. 
feel like he's turned to God, but he didn't just turn to God. He's living the life that God has called him to live. And because of that, he is experiencing the blessing of God. He is thriving because the favor of God is on his life because that's who he trusts. This is the being, the power in his life. Going to watch over him, will never leave him, will never forsake him. And and, and he is living that. He is enjoying the experience. Even when he's in prison. He's in Pharaoh's prison, but the principle is still applicable there. Yes, he's struggling with confinement, but he's feeling the favor of God and he's in charge of all of the other prisoners. And we don't understand that. We just know that if we ever want to move from the position of just barely surviving to the place where we're thriving, then we've got to draw close to God. We've got to live the life that God has called us to live. And we have got to, we have got to be obedient to God. Have that communion, have the fellowship. Sometimes the situations that we face are going to be trying. They're going to be difficult. It's going to be hard to make the decisions that are in front of us. We're going to be tempted to take the easy way out of some of our situations. But God is asking us to trust Him, to be faithful, to watch and see Him come through when we think that there is no way to watch Him actually make a way. And so He invites us. He invites us to His table. God wants us to have a family relationship. In, in our own families, God wants us to thrive. We know that God wants us to thrive because when Jesus was talking about shepherding and being the good shepherd and he was declaring himself to be the good shepherd that people had been waiting for, he says this, he says, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I have come that you may have life and that you may have it in abundance. God wants us to experience the good life, the joys of life. That's what he wants for us. But sometimes we're looking to these difficult situations and we see Joseph struggling in his situation and we're saying, how is the good life going to come out of a difficult situation like that? We just continue watching the activity of God in his life and we get to understand that. But in our families, God wants us to have those relationships. He wants when we're sitting at the table and we're having that family time that we check in with each other. How are you doing? How did your day go? What were your highlights? What are the things that you're struggling with? Can we as a family give godly counsel about the situation that you're experiencing? Can we as a family just pray together? The, fa- the, the table is the place where we come and we spend time with each other, recognizing that God is the head of our table. I remember that my my father used to have this expression. He used, when we come to the table, he used to say, okay, somebody say grace. Not grace, like, no. That's not what he meant. He wanted us to acknowledge that God provides for us. He wanted us to thank God for his goodness and the fact that we have food on our table, that we shouldn't take that for granted, but we should be grateful and live a life of gratitude. And this is what happens at the table. You come to the table and you're just experiencing that sense of goodness. I like the way that the Bible helps us to understand the beginning of the church because that family environment shouldn't be confined to your immediate family. It's important for us to recognize that we all come from Adam. We all come from Noah, that we are related to each other. We're all children of God. It's good to recognize that. And when we come into the church, we're a family of faith. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2 that on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came down on these believers and God was showing His power in an incredible way, where people were faced with what they had done, the sin that they'd committed in calling for the crucifixion of Jesus, that that was God's Messiah, God's anointed Messiah who was crucified. That was brought to their attention and they didn't know what to do, how to respond. They said, men and brothers, what shall we do? Peter said, repent and let each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus. 
and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you, for your children, for those who are far off, that, that God is just wanting the blessing of His Spirit living inside us to be universal, that we be drawn together as family in that. When you continue to read about how the church progressed, in Acts chapter 2, verse 47, it says, they devoted themselves to the teaching, the teaching of the apostles, to fellowship. Fellowship for me is an important word. I, th I think we've changed it in some of our church circles where sometimes when people mean fellowship, they say swallowship because they've got this idea, we're going to come together and we're going to eat. We're going to have a meal together because there's something about eating together and just spending that time sharing a meal that endears people to each other. But they were devoted to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. They were eating together. Day by day, they continued from house to house, just in fellowship with each other, breaking bread and having that family experience, building each other up in their faith, helping each other to grow in the understanding of who God is. And I believe that when God invites us to the table, when Jesus says, come to the table, it's because he wants us to have that. Not necessarily the food, more about just being together and having the experience. The food is good. It needs to be good. I, we all enjoy good food. I remember a Portuguese friend, a few of my Portuguese friends saying, you know, with most people, they eat to live. But we Portuguese people, man, we live to eat. And, and, and food is an important part. It needs to be good. And we spend time. Sometimes you can sit at a table and have breakfast together and come after lunch, midday. They're still at the table and they've had lots more to eat but they're drawing closer to each other. And it's just a time to enjoy life and to enjoy people. And I believe that the reason that Jesus calls us to the table is because he wants us to experience the joys of life, the goodness of life. And I, and I remember when I first came to Swatini as a bachelor, the, the times that were really difficult for me were the meal times. It's, it's so difficult to sit and eat your food alone. It's good to have people around you and enjoy that. Just enjoy family, that experience. And this is why we are invited to the table. We come to the table, we praise God, we appreciate Him for His goodness in our lives, and we experience the joy of fellowship. With Joseph and his family, that first experience was a little bit difficult. See, what happened was at the age of 17, he was sold into slavery. And then after that, he ended up in prison. And it was only when he was 30 years old that he was released. But he was released with the favor of God on him. And he was in charge of everything that was taking place in Egypt. Pharaoh was only the only person who was exalted above Joseph. He had the power, he had the authority, he had means, and he had done an incredible job. For five years, till he was 35 years old, oh, sorry, for seven years, till he was 37 years old, he was enjoying the harvest, the years of, of abundance, and he was storing away food because he knew that hard times were coming. There was a famine that was coming. And then two years into the famine, 10 people came in asking to buy food. And as he looked at these 10 people, they were familiar faces. Those were his brothers. And I'm trying to imagine what it would have been like for him in his times of isolation as he's sitting there and he's eating his meals alone and the situations around him are so difficult how he misses home, how we think back to family when we're estranged, those good relationships and the good times that we had together. But for him, it's also some difficult times. His brothers wanted to kill him. He remembers that. Here they are, and they're coming and they're begging for food. I don't know what he was thinking about them in the hard times. But now he's got to make up his mind about how he's going to treat them. And I don't know that it was an easy thing. I don't think it was an easy thing. Initially, he interrogates them. He, he speaks through an interpreter. They don't know who he is. 
and he asks them where they're from and what they're doing there. And he accuses them of being spies who have come to find out what are the weaknesses of Egypt. And they try, they, they plead their cases. That's not, they, they're all brothers. They're from one family. I wonder what it must have felt like for Joseph when his brothers say, there were 12 of us, but one of us is dead. As he stands there and he listens to that, and he's like, is that, is that what you thought happened to me? And now he's, he's got to figure out what is he going to do? How is he going to respond? So he confines them for three days. They're confined. He's like, he wants to know more about their family. He wants to know, do you have a father? Is your father still alive? How is your father? Were there just 10 of you? Do you not have any other siblings? And they talk, we, we have a brother. He's at home with dad. What's his name? Make sure that the next time that you come here, you bring him with you. He wants to see his brother Benjamin again. He misses him incredibly. He tells them, you can go home. I'm going to keep Simeon here. You, the rest of you, you can go home, get Benjamin and come back. You won't see me again if you don't bring him with. So the next time they do, they, they, they go home and they explain to dad, oh, sometimes before we come to the table, we need to clear the air. I've got to go home and they tell their father, Simeon isn't with us anymore. There's a man in Egypt who has him and he won't release him unless we bring Benjamin to him. And Joseph is thinking, I, uh, Jacob is thinking, I've already lost one son. I'm not going to lose another. There is no way that I'm going to release Benjamin. Because I've lost one son. The other one isn't quite lost yet. Potential of losing him is really high. But I'm not letting Benjamin go through. Love Benjamin so very much. When they see his sadness, he's explaining the reason that he doesn't want to lose Benjamin is because he's already lost Joseph. He's been in mourning for 22 years. And they look at his face every day and they can't bring themselves to tell him what they did. What they actually did was they came home, they took his coat, they killed a goat, they put goat's blood onto his coat, and they came home and they said, uh, Dad, we found this in the field. Have a look at it and see if it doesn't perhaps resemble the coat that you made for your son. And there's this secret that they've got to sit with for 22 years. And they look into their sad dad's face. And they know that he's struggling with his loss. And they can't bring themselves around to saying, we did this. And now things are getting worse. You know, when Joseph had them for three days and they were talking to each other in his hearing, they didn't know that he understood what they were saying because he was speaking through an interpreter. One of the things that they said is like, it seems like our sins have caught up with us. Perhaps it's because of the way that we treated Joseph. And when we looked into his face, when he was pleading with us for his life, maybe it's because of that that we're in this situation today. They don't have that freedom as they go through life. There's, this, there's something that's in the air that needs to be cleared. And I wish that they would just clear the air. God wants us to clear the air. In Psalm 32, beginning at verse 1, this is the psalmist David who says, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, okay? whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and whose, in whose spirit there is no deceit. There aren't lies in the spirit. He says, When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me, and my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. And then I acknowledged my sin to you, 
and I did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. And I want to say that this is what the table represents. When we as Christian people come to the table, it's bread and wine and we're recognizing we're one, we're in the body of Christ and we're recognizing that Jesus died so that our sin could be forgiven because he was going to take the guilt of our sin on himself when he went to the cross. That there's forgiveness, the air needs to be cleared, the table needs to be a place where we can come, we can have joy, we can have fellowship, we can have communion with God, we can have a cleansing that comes from God. When we have our table experiences, when we come together as a family, when we come together as a community, that same atmosphere needs to be there. Sometimes when you, the family comes together, we're so disappointed and so focused on the wrong or the bad that somebody has done that this is what we bring up and we just throw that around. We allow that to just wait in the air and make the atmosphere so heavy that it's hard to enjoy the food no matter how good it is. But that's not what God wants us to do. God wants us to recognize that forgiveness is not just possible but necessary. In order for us to move from surviving to thriving, let's not carry those burdens of things from the past. Let's not go 500 years down the line and get to a place where we can't sit at the same table anymore. Or that our descendants who don't even know the history of what went wrong are not able to sit at the same table again. This is not the heart of God. The, the kingdom of God is a banquet table that God invites all of his children to because he wants us to experience life and life in abundance. This is why he says, come to the table. So when we come to the table, God's expectation is that we will serve in love. I remember a time when a Pharisee invited Jesus to his home. The text doesn't tell us what was the reason for the invitation. And I'm not really sure. I'd like to think it's because he recognizes that Jesus is this great Messiah, the Son of God, the one that they've been waiting for, and he wants to honor him with a meal. But that's not the impression that reading the rest of the text leaves me with. Because at some point in the meal, when a lady has come in, and she has washed the feet of Jesus with her tears, dried his feet with her hair, anointed his feet with expensive perfume. And people are complaining about the cost of the perfume. And the Pharisees in his company are looking at the situation and they're saying, this man cannot possibly be the Messiah of God. He is not a prophet. If he was a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. He wouldn't allow that. And then Jesus talks about how the people who are forgiven more loves more. But he also says, Simon, I want you to know this about hospitality. When I came in, you did not give me water to wash my feet. You did not give me a kiss of greeting. You did not anoint my head with oil. That was standard hospitality practices in, in the day of Jesus. And he didn't receive that. So I'm not sure that the Pharisee felt like this is the Messiah. This is the son of God who's coming to have a meal at my table. I think he was there to grill Jesus perhaps. But that's not the point. The point is that Jesus accepted the invitation. He wanted to be there. He felt like he could just bring some kind of teaching that you can bring a change of heart at the table. When you're having that meal together and you're enjoying good food, that's a good time to change hearts. I remember a time when the chief of tax collectors in Israel was sitting in a sycamore tree looking down on Jesus. And as Jesus stops and pays attention to him, he invites himself to that person's house. A tax collector. The people around him are surprised. How can you associate? Tax collectors are horrible people. They take your money, they take more money than they're supposed to. They take your money, they give it to the Romans that funds an army that keeps us in suppressions. Like, how can we live with people like that in our society? 
Jesus recognizes that at the table, there will be an opportunity to bring about a change of heart. And he invites himself to that man's house. And the change of heart is very evident when he says, I'm going to give half of my possessions to the poor and I'm going to pay back everybody that I've robbed four times what I've taken from them unduly. There's a change of heart because they had the time at the table and the table is a good place. It's where we just let things down, where we open ourselves up, where we make ourselves vulnerable, where we confess the things that we need to confess, where we recognize family values and unity and love. And when I look at Saswati, I just love so many things about the culture in Eswatini. I love that there's only one tribe here. When I look at other places in Africa where there's so many different tribes and you see tribal rivalry, you struggle with that. When I go to the funerals, when I go to, and I've been to a number of funerals in Eswatini, it surprises me that so often you see so many of the same people there. Have you noticed that? It's like, man, it's like this country's related. Everybody is somehow connected uh, through marriage and family and blood that, that, that we're a unit. And that's such an important and precious thing. When people who are traveling into Saswati, especially from South Africa, but all over the place, they, they almost immediately sense a peace as you come in here. And that's valuable. Peace is so valuable to God that that's what he died for. Jesus comes as the Prince of Peace to bring peace because he wants us to have peace. And it begins when we sit down together at the table and we just enjoy fellowship. We enjoy company. We enjoy love that God has intended for us. There's a passage in 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning at verse 9, where he's saying, Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. And each one of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. And if anyone speaks, they should do so as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength that God provides. And in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. And as we listen to that, as we, we recognize this is a call to hospitality, a call to serving each other, to using the gifting that God has given us. I want to go back to table conversation. If anyone speaks, it should be as one speaking the very words of God. Some people, I don't know why, think that God's language is King James English. And when they pray, you'll hear them, Therefore, Heavenly Father, we beseech thee, wherefore <laughs> thou art holy, almighty God. It's like they're communicating to God in his language. And I don't think that this is what the passage is saying. I think the passage is saying, let's have the heart of God. And let's, when we speak, recognize that what we say has the ability to either elevate and heal or break down and destroy. And sometimes we think, no, this is discipline. I'm showing this person what they're doing that's wrong. We've got to try and think about the consequences of the things that we say, especially at the table. And if we're speaking the very words of God to say things that we believe is going to help, it's going to lift the person up. It's going to change the way that the person thinks and have the person move out of striving into the area of thriving. And the words that we speak, if they come from God, have got the power to do that. When we speak, we could speak on behalf of God and change the world in which we live. So let's do that. God invites us to his banquet the kingdom of God is like a king whose son was going to get married and he went out and he invited guests so that they can come and they can enjoy fellowship at time at a table. That's what the kingdom of God is likened to. There's a passage in Revelation 99 that says, Blessed is the one who's been invited to the king's banquet. I look back to Joseph's situation. Joseph was thinking about what he was going to do with regard to these brothers of his who tried to kill him. 
he has had time to think about that because they've gone home and they've brought Joseph and they've come back with Joseph. And there they are. They're back again. Lo and behold, they're bowing down to him, just like in the dream. And he's got the ability to do whatever he wants to do to them. And here's what he did. He spoke to his servants and he said, take these people to my house and set up a meal for them. We're going to have food. Now, in those days, there was that tension between the Hebrew people and the Egyptian people. So there were actually three tables in Joseph's house. He had the 10 brothers who were sitting at one table. They looked at each other in amaze. How is it that they're seated in order of their age around the table? And when they look at uh, Benjamin's plate, he's got five times more food on his plate than they've got. But everybody has got enough to eat and drink. It's a feast. The Egyptians are sitting at their table and Joseph is sitting at the third table. There's still that disunity. But his response to what his brothers did to him is to bless them. He forgives them and he puts in a time of famine. They've come begging for food. They're looking for scraps. He's putting out an incredible meal. We're thinking to the, the words of the psalmist when David says, God spreads a table before me in the presence of my enemies. He anoints my head with oil and my cup runs over. God wants us to thrive. Joseph is the one who's putting out the meal for his enemies. And he's calling them in and he wants to bury the hatchet. He wants to let it go. He wants forgiveness to be experienced. He wants them to know what love is. He wants to know that he's going to bless them, that he wants his family, the whole family, to come and live in Egypt, in the best land in Egypt, in Goshen. He sends gifts and he is just overwhelmed. His heart is full of love and peace and there's a joy that comes. My family is more important than the past and the history and whatever's gone on. Perhaps they had reason for doing what they did, and perhaps their reasons aren't even adequate. But family unity, as far as God is concerned, for us to live together as people who love each other, who are united and who want each other's best. This is what the kingdom of God is about. This is the great banquet that we're invited to. I'd like to ask the worship team, if you will, to please come back. There's a lady by the name of Shauna Nisquit who once said, when we come to the table, we don't come to fight or defend. We don't come to prove or defend. We don't come to draw lines in the sand or to stir up trouble. We come to the table because our hunger brings us here. We come with a need, and the table is the great equalizer. The masks are removed, and we are allowed to be ourselves, to be nourished, just like children. The table is a place of safety. It is a place of rest. It is a place of humanity. And we are allowed to be as fragile as we feel. And God is inviting us to come to the table. Be a loving family united. Before that death, the crucifixion, when he was sitting with his disciples in the Last Supper, that's when he said, I'm giving you a new commandment. Love one another the way that I have loved you. And by this will all people know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And then he goes on in that mealtime. He tells them, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is going to be inside. He's going to change who you are, the way that you think, the way that you behave, so that you can be loving people, that you can bear much fruit. You're connected to Jesus. You're bearing the kind of fruit that Jesus wants you to bear because the Holy Spirit is in you. Sometimes we can't come to the table and we can't go through the acts of forgiving and showing mercy and all of that things because we're not led by the Spirit and it's hard for us to do. But the Spirit is something that's free, available, and easily accessible. You can receive the Holy Spirit right now even. Can I ask that we stand up? And can I say that God is still inviting us to His table? It's not the divided table. It's the united table, one table where He's going to be the head of the table. We don't have to worry about where we're sitting so that we can be close to God because He's inside us. 
and we can just absolutely enjoy recognizing that it was at the cross that this was made possible. But the death of Jesus is about bringing two hostile groups together. He comes as peace to bring peace so that we can enjoy peace. And I pray that as you spend time in communion with Jesus and fellowship at the table, that the strive or the surviving and that struggle that we're experiencing in life will just go away, that we will thrive and that the blessing of the presence of God will be on your life. I pray for you that everything that you touch will just have God's favor on it and that people will recognize God is with you because you've come to his table and you've come with his attitude. God bless you as you come to the table.